Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Our God and our Father, we bless your name today. We thank you because whenever we gather together, it is your pleasure and your delight to reveal yourself to us. Therefore, Father, we pray tonight that the mystery concerning the Lord Jesus Christ you reveal to us more and more from tonight's study in Jesus' name. We pray that you strengthen our faith, increase our knowledge, so that we can wholeheartedly lean upon him and depend upon him for time and eternity. Be with us, Lord, and teach us by your Spirit as we look into the pages of the scriptures tonight, in Jesus' name we pray. We are seeing a study of the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians, or in chapter 1. Already Paul the Apostle had sent greetings to the believers at Ephesus. He had appreciated them, calling them saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. He had given thanks for them. He had given thanks because a Epaphroditus or Epaphras had given him the report concerning these Colossian Christians. He had heard that they had received the gospel of truth. And this gospel of the truth of God had made them to know that Jesus Christ is a Savior. It had resulted in faith and hope and love in them. Not only this, it had been bearing fruit in their lives. And the fruit it had borne had gone through all the world around them. And the report had come to Paul the Apostle because of that he praised the Lord for them. Not only that, he was also in his petition, in his prayer, asking that they will be filled with the knowledge of his will. In particular, there had been false preachers or false prophets that had gone to Colossae. They wanted to confuse these people concerning the knowledge they ought to have. And therefore, Paul the Apostle prayed for them. As he praised the name of the Lord, he prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He said thereafter, then they will be able to walk worthy and he will please the Lord. They will be put to in every good work. They will increase or grow in spiritual things. They will be strengthened with all spiritual minds and with all spiritual strength and glorious power. They will have patience and long suffering. So they will be able to endure whatever they were going through with joyfulness or with happiness. He also gave thanks. He gave thanks on the point that they had an inheritance. He gave thanks on the point that they were delivered. Give thanks because they had been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He also was giving thanks because they were redeemed and their sins were forgiven. Haman said all that in the preliminary. He now came to the real thing that he wanted to make sure they understood. You see, at that time, there were Gnostics. That is, there were people that didn't have the right knowledge about Jesus Christ. And they were peddling all kinds of falsehood and error concerning the Lord Jesus Christ to the Colossian Christians. The consequence is that they were telling these Colossian people that Christ was not sufficient. And they couldn't go through Christ directly and go to God. They needed to add some other things. What they were teaching these people in their error, they called 
some great names. And the Apostle Paul saw that these people were likely to be confused because they were thinking of the world things, that Christ was not sufficient. And because of this, he wrote to them to establish them. And in establishing them, he talked about the centrality and the supremacy of Christ. See the uh, kind of highlight that tells us that these false preachers were telling them that Christ was not complete for them. They wanted to lead them into some mysterious things, some hidden things that were not according to the truth. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, he told them, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and being deceived after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He told them that those people that were pretending to have knowledge, they were pretending to have philosophy, or they were pretending to have something greater or richer than all that they had learned of the things of Christ, that those things were not sufficient, that, that, that is, the things of Christ were not sufficient. These people were trying to confuse them, and he said, they were. He told them in chapter 2, verse 16, he said, Let no man therefore judge you in me or in drink, or in respect of an holiday, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. They were telling these people that even though you believe in Christ, that's not sufficient. You must add the new moon. You must add the drink offering. You must add the meat offering. You must add the Sabbath and some holidays, religious holidays. And these people were likely to be confused, and therefore Paul the Apostle came to them, and he wanted to show them the sufficiency and the supremacy and the headship of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and the worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, then they popped up by his fleshly mind. You see, these people that came to Colossae to confuse the people, they were trying to tell them that Jesus Christ was a great emanation, a great spirit. And as he came, they, they wanted the Colossians to understand that also the angels were great spirits, emanations from God. And they were saying that these spirits and supernatural beings were in different, different categories. And therefore, they shouldn't be holding to Jesus Christ alone. And Paul, the apostle, came on direct and he warned them that nobody will deceive them, nobody will beguile them, and nobody will lead them into some kind of humility, into some kind of the worshipping of angels, intruding or peeping into those things that they did not understand. He said in verse 19 that the reason why they were doing that is that they were not holding the head. They were not recognizing the headship and the centrality and the supremacy of Christ, not holding the head from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. And so he wanted to assure these people that Jesus Christ is central, is sufficient, is supreme, is the head. And he wanted to show them the importance of Jesus Christ. And so the passage we are studying today hits on the real centrality of the Bible revelation. Look at it. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. You can see what Paul was emphasizing to the people. This passage highlights what the whole Bible reveals. If you're a student of the Bible, you will know that Jesus Christ is the central message of the Bible. In the Old Testament, 
Jesus Christ was being prepared for because the whole, the totality of the whole Old Testament is the preparation for Christ's coming. In the Gospels, you have the presentation of Christ. In Acts of the Apostles, you have the proclamation of Christ. In the Epistles, you have the personification of Christ. And in the Revelation, you have the predomination of Christ. The whole thing is about Christ. That is why you will find that the central message of Acts of the Apostles is the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Acts chapter, 20, chapter 9, verse 22. Acts chapter 9, verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is a very Christ. How did he do that? He went on to the Old Testament. And in all the parts of the Old Testament, he saw that the Old Testament was the preparation and the presentation and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. They only made the way for Jesus Christ to come. And as he turned to the Old Testament, he proved conclusively, convincingly, that this is a very Christ. Look at Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. What does that mean, out of the Scriptures? Out of the Old Testament. In the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. In the writings of the prophets and the kings. And in the writings of the Psalms, the poetical books, and what they say, what they what they call the writings, the hagiographer, he proved unto them in the totality of the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Look at verse three, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. You can see what Paul the Apostle was emphasizing, that the Old Testament all conclusively, convincingly talked about Jesus as the Christ. Look at chapter 18 of Acts. Acts chapter 18, verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Christ. That's why Jesus Christ himself told the Jews, he said, they shall search the scriptures. In John chapter 5, verse 39. John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures. For in them, you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. He told these religious Jews, he said, you have the Old Testament, you have the scriptures, Search them, read them, try to understand them, interpret them, because in them you think you have eternal life. You carry that book of God about, believing that God has given it to you and thinking that through it you will have eternal life. Well, check up and you will find that in the Old Testament, I am presented as the one that will give you eternal life day at day that testify of me. In fact, when Jesus Christ himself rose from the dead, and the disciples were confused as to what Jesus Christ has done, and what has become of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what Jesus Christ did? He convinced them from the scriptures that he is the one that should have come and should have suffered in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, from verse 27, and beginning at Moses. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, and beginning at Moses. That is when Jesus Christ spoke to the confused disciples concerning what he has done, concerning his death and burial and resurrection, concerning his ministry and concerning the salvation, the plan of redemption. He went back to the book of the beginning, to Genesis, to the book of Moses. And he went to all the Old Testament, convincing them of the scriptures that concerned him. Look at 44. And he said unto them, 
These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, which is the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, you see that, and in the Psalms concerning me, then open to their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's why the Bible is called the book of Jesus Christ. It's the Jesus book. From the beginning to the very end, it's talking about Jesus. Let's look at the passages that Jesus must have been referring to. From Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here God himself spoke out, spoke about the old serpent, and about Eve, the woman, and said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. And then spoke about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And you know that human beings are referred to as the seed of man. You, the son in your bear is the name of your father or your grandfather, always referring to the name of a man. But you see, Christ came through the virgin, the seed of the woman. And then the prophecy here is that it shall bruise thy, thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, from the very beginning, referring to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 from verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. You see that capital P? That's the prophet greater than all other prophets. That's the one that is to be the mouthpiece of the Almighty God. That's the express image of the Father. That is the one that will reveal the Father in unmistakable terms. That is the one that is the only one that is qualified to say. You've seen the Father, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Anything you want to hear from the Father, that is what I've told you. Is a prophet with a capital P. Prophet greater than all the other prophets. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. Verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet, capital P, from among their brethren. Like unto thee, I will put my word in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I, I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my word, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. The God of heaven said, I will send him. He that shall come shall come. And when he comes, he will say nothing but my word. And anyone in any place, anyone in any country, anyone from any background that will not listen to my mouthpiece that I will send, I will require it from him. In Psalm 2, verse 12. Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled, least but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust, their faith in him. You see how the Old Testament consistently talks about Jesus Christ, stretch the scriptures. For in them you can see have eternal life. And those scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, are they which testify of me. He is the Son. What does that mean? Who is that Son? Isaiah tells us. Isaiah chapter 9. And in verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so Paul the Apostle wanted these Colossian believers to understand the centrality and the supremacy of Christ. These false prophets trying to pervert the gospel of Christ had been preaching heresies to the saints, to the children of God at Colossae. They were telling the people that Christ was not sufficient for their full salvation. 
And therefore, Paul wanted to emphasize to the Colossian believers the sufficiency of Christ. He wanted to show them that Christ is God. And that Christ created the whole universe. And that Christ is the head of the church. Those are the three points that surround or that underline what he brought out today in the passage we have read. Christ, the very image of the invisible God. Christ, the creator of all things. Christ, the head of the church. Let's look at them one by one. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? When it mentions who, who does that refer to? You go back to verse 13. Who delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Mentioning that son in verse 13, he goes on to that to verse 14. In whom? That is, in that son. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Concerning this son, this is what we have to say in verse 13. He is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. As we talk about the image of God, you may remember if you are students of the Bible that Adam was created as an image of God. But even at that time, he was the image of God, not in totality and perfection, because he wasn't God. He was created innocent and holy. He was created with the ability to think, ability to plan. Ability to make decisions on the basis of facts. In that way, he was created the image of God, but not the flawless, perfect essence of the image of God. Today, when we are born again, it is true that as we are born again, we come to have the image of the Lord. This is what we are told in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 24. And ye are put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It is true that when we are born again today, we have the mind of Christ, we have the nature of the Lord in a way, we have a change of life, and therefore you can say, well, we have the image of God, but not in perfection. We are not the very essence of the image of God. But then, when you talk about the very essence, the flawless, the perfect, the replica of God Almighty Himself, you are talking about Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. In short, that is telling you that Jesus is God. And the Bible says that all over, that Jesus is God. Let me show you from the word of God. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Reading from verse 21 to verse 23. And you will learn of Jesus Christ. And you learn of the supremacy of Christ. You learn of the very essence of Christ. Is the image of the invisible God. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be a child, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted is God with us. Emmanuel is Jesus. Emmanuel is God. Jesus is is God. So you can see conclusively from the word of God that he is God. It's not just like God, but he is God. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, reading from verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. In the beginning was the word, from the dateless past, from generations and ages past, from eternity past, without beginning, without end. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He had been with God from all eternity. Not only that, the Word was God. 
the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You can see here the personality of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ. And here is what the erroneous teachers and the false teachers that came to call us say. This is what they wanted to remove. They wanted to remove the divinity, the deity. They wanted to remove the supernatural nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to remove the fact that Jesus is God, the creator of all things. You see, God is not visible to any human flesh. If you ever read in the Bible that somebody saw God, it's not in his great brightness of glory, which no man can see. Look at John chapter 1 verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. That is in his fullness of glory, in the brightness of his glory, in his majesty and power. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus Christ came and he became, he made God visible. Jesus is the only perfect, flawless, essential image of God. Is the exact image, the replica of God. The only perfect representation of God. The precise image of God without anything that is missing. And so Paul the Apostle wanted these people to be convinced that this is a very God. Let's look at Psalm 45 for a moment. Psalm 45, reading verses 6 and 7. Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Do you understand these two verses we have read together? In verse 6, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then in verse 7, it said, Therefore, God, thy God. You can see that it's, re it's uh, referring to two personalities in the Godhead. The verse 6 is referring to Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, you see, how can that be Jesus Christ? Let me show you the interpretation of the Holy Ghost himself. You know what Jesus said before he left? He said, if there is anything you don't know about me, when the Holy Ghost is come, he will reveal all things to you concerning me. Let us see what the Holy Ghost has revealed. But remember what I've read to you in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou, that is the God of Basrach, thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Let us see the interpretation of the Holy Ghost in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who maketh his angels spirit, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You can see the Son here being referred to as God. You can see Psalm 45 that I read to you. It is talking about Jesus Christ. No wonder. Jesus said, search the scripture. Search the scripture. Are any, is anybody trying to confuse you? Search the scripture. Is anybody trying to tell you that Christ is not sufficient? Search the scripture. Is anybody telling you that Jesus is not God? Search the scripture. Is anybody telling you that Jesus is not sufficient for time and for eternity? Search the scripture. Because the scriptures are there that testify of me. And therefore we learn in all these passages that Jesus is God. Look at this Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1. God 
towards country time for in diverse manners spirit in times past. Unto the fathers by the prophet, as in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. By whom also he made the world. You will see that the world here is in the plural. By the world is meant all the planets. And the scientists have been trying to study the planets. And they have discovered a lot of planets. In fact, they have told us now that the temperature of the sun, the sun is like a, is a planet on its own. The temperature of the sun is so hot, it's so terrible. And that the sun is so big that when you put millions of this earth in which we are now into the sun, into that kind of volume, you still have a lot of space that you can put a lot of millions of moons and still put in the sun. The thing is so massive. And when you realize this, by Jesus Christ, the Father made everything. And they tell us that there are, there are planets that are so big. There's a planet that they just they discovered recently, and that planet is so big that the diameter of that planet is uh, greater. The diameter, that is uh, from the radius from the center to the, uh, to the rim or to the circumference, and then to this way also, that it is more than the orbit of the Earth. That is all the orbit, all the things that the Earth is passing through. That uh, the diameter of that planet is much more than even the orbit, not to talk of the circumference of the Earth. And it is Jesus Christ that made all those things. By him, all things were made. Without him, there was not anything made that, that was made. People who don't understand the Bible, they say, when I read in the Bible that Jesus turned water into wine, I don't understand how he had that power. Uh -uh. Turning water into wine is a simple thing. He created the whole earth. There was nothing made that, uh, that he did not make. He made everything, the earth and the planets and the stars and the moon and the sun and all the things that the scientists have seen and the things they have not seen. Who is the brightness? of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down the right hand of the majesty on high. This Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's why the Bible says that he made himself of no reputation. Neither did he count it anything wrong because he was equal with God. Look at this in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This Jesus being the, in the form of God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And that's what he said. He said, I and my Father are one. And when the Jews heard that, they knew he meant that he was God. They wanted to stone him. And he said, why do you want to stone me? They said, because you make yourself God. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10 from verse 30. I and my father are one. What a sublime statement. What a great statement. What a mind-boggling statement. Something that is, is mysterious. You cannot understand this with your finite mind. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up the stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work will stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou being a man, makest thyself God. They knew that he made a claim. They knew that he said so, that he was God. That's why he told them, Go and search your scriptures, and go and read in the Psalms, and go and read in the prophets, and you will see that the prophets call me God. And so I am talking about Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 9, let us look at it again. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He told them to search the scriptures. If they had searched the scriptures very well, they would have had no problem at all. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And what's his name? His name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor. His name shall be called the mighty God. Jesus is God. Do you believe that? That's the revelation of the scripture. You see the people that are fighting revelation of scripture? It is this Jesus Christ, the God of heaven and earth, that will judge us on the last day. 
and will judge all the unbelieving people. This is why Paul the Apostle wanted the people to know that Jesus Christ is sufficient, that Jesus Christ is centrality of the revelation of God. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. He also wanted to show them that this Jesus we're talking about is the creator of all things. Colossians chapter 1. Let me read verse 15 again and point out something before we go on to verse 16. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. The firstborn. Now the Greek here does not mean the firstborn in a family like you understand firstborn. It's talking about firstborn in, in the sense of position, in the sense of authority, in the sense of headship, in the sense of power. It's not talking of time. You see some false preachers, those people that carry bags and Bibles and literature about in their bag, and they always are talking about wanting to inherit this world and wanting to talk about Armageddon. Those people, they say, don't you know that Jesus was first of all created? And after that, the angels were created. And after that, the human beings were created because the Bible says is the firstborn of every creature. No, this is not talking of firstborn in the sense of time. It's not chronology. It is not in the sense of chronological kind of period. Christ was created first and then this and then that. He's talking about the fact that is the one that has the preeminence. The firstborn, the head. The firstborn in position. The firstborn, the heir of all things. That is what we're told in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. As in these last days, spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. That's the meaning. The heir of all things. The authority that is appointed. The headship and the Lord that is appointed by whom also he made the world. By whom also he made the world. Now, Jesus is the creator of all things. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 16. For by him were all things created. For by him were all things created. You see, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not a minor thing. It is not something that you can just brush aside and say, well, there is nothing to it. He is worshipping God in another way, and you say you are born again. Worshipping God another way is different. Jesus created all things. He is the creator of all things. All things that are in heaven, all things that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominion or power or principalities, all things were created by him and for him. You see what we're learning about Jesus Christ? This, can, this is a mystery that had been held from many Gentiles for a long time. This is a mystery that many false prophets had not known for a long time. That is being revealed by the Spirit of God. By him were all things created. Whether they are things in heaven or things in earth. When you mention the name of Jesus, that's a great name. It's the name of the creator. It's the name of the one that created all things above and below. It's the name of the one that is in charge of everything. The one that has dominion over thrones and dominions and, and principalities and powers. All things were made by him. All things were created by him. And all things were created for his glory. That is why all creation should honor him. That is why all creation should worship him. That is why all creation should accept him and know him and reverence him as Lord and God and Savior and Redeemer. For the very fact that he created all things, let's look again at Psalms. He told us to study the scriptures. Let's study the scriptures today. Psalm 102. Psalm 102. Reading from verse 25. Of old, as thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, of all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture. Thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years have no end. Who is this being referred to as the everlasting one? Who is this being referred to? as the one that will continue forever and ever. Who is this that we are being told in the psalm that is the same yesterday and today and forever? 
Who is this that we are being told that he laid the foundations of the earth and even the heavens and the earth and the galaxies and the Milky Way and all the planets, they are the work of his hand. Who is this that we are being told that even when these things are rolled up and when they are dissolved, that when they are waxed old or waxing old like a garment and they are rolled up and they are changed, but he will remain the same forever and ever. Who is this? Let the Bible give us the answer again. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Reading from verse 10. And thou, Lord, is the one we're talking about. His name is Jesus. He created all things. He made all things. And everything is being upheld by the glory of his power. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of man's hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same. Thy years fail not. Thy years fail not. And later in Hebrews chapter 13, the writer makes it very clear what he's talking about. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, if years fail not. The same yesterday, and today, and forever. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the creator of all things. Let's go back to John. We read it before, it's good to read it again. John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. Who is this? Verse 14 tells us. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld this glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ. Go back to verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, by Jesus Christ. Without him was not anything made that was, that was made. The next time when you sit on a chair, remember that chair came from wood. Remember that wood came from the forest. Remember all the woods on the, in the forest? All things were made by him. Nothing made that was made. Remember you sit down, give thanks and praises to the Lord Jesus who created everything. The next time you get in your vehicle, remember the tire, the rubber, the engine, and the iron, and the glass. Just look around, and everything you sit on, everything you touch, and everything that is moving, ask yourself from where this is, from where is this coming? From the minerals of the earth. How did they get there? All things were made by Him and raised up from praise unto the Lord Jesus Christ. The next time you sit at the meal and you eat your food, just uh, remember who created even the earth and the soil from which all the yam and all the cassava and all the beans and all the potato and everything has grown up. By him were all things made. There was nothing made that was not made by him. And before you eat that food, thank some uh, praises unto the name of Jesus Christ who made everything. The next time you take your bath with water, and you clean your body, uh, you need to ask yourself, from where do we have all the rivers and all the water and all the ocean? Then you will remember all things were made by him. And don't leave that kitchen or don't leave that toilet or don't leave that bathroom or don't leave that place or using that water without raising up some praises to the Lord because he made everything. And he made everything for us so that we can enjoy. The next time you breathe air and you are breathing air right now. Just remember that you are kept alive by him. Look at verse 4. In him was life. Without the air he made, even the unbeliever will not be able to have his subsistence and existence. In him was life. The life was a life of man. The next time you breathe and the next time you have anything that you say, without this, without the creation of this, the creation of this, the creation of this, how will I have life or find life convenient? And remember, everything was made by him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And in verse 6. But to all there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, 
by whom are all things, and we by him. By whom are all things, and we by him. The infallible word of God gives us the unparalleled revelation concerning Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things, all things in heaven and in earth, all things visible and invisible, and that it is by his power that all things in the universe are still held together even till this very time. His power is so great that the miracles that he did were just the normal and the simple manifestations of his ministry. There are some people that read the Bible and they doubt the miracles that Jesus Christ performed. How could he open the blind eyes? How could he make the lame to walk? How could he uh, give this? How could he give that? How could he deliver the people? Don't you understand that he has been given authority over all things, over all dominion, all power, all throne, all principalities? He is the one that has all authority and he still has authority over all things even today. Whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities and powers, that is why his name still carries great power even today. And at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, from verse 8, and being found in passion as a man, he humbled himself. He did it. He humbled himself. No man took his life from him. He laid it down himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. He is the one that has authority. Whether of things in heaven or things in earth or things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now verses 18 and 19. Paul the Apostle revealed to these Colossian Christians and he told them they should not allow anybody to confuse them. They should not think that Christ is not sufficient because Christ is also the head of the church. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead? That in all things he might have the preeminence, and for it has pleased God the Father, that in him should all things, all the fullness dwell. Here we are told of Jesus Christ as the head of the body, the head of the church. The church is likened to a body, and the various members are the members of the body, and Christ is the head of that body. The people who have studied uh, the anatomy of the body will tell you that there is a part of the brain that makes you to grow. Without that part of the brain, you will, your body will not even grow normally. And Christ being the head is the one that supplies everything to the joints, everything to the various members of the church that makes the church to grow. And it is the head that gives us the direction. You know, it is because of the thinking and the planning and, you know, the wisdom coming from the head that we're able to go in the right direction. And Christ is the head of the church. That means is the source of power, is the reason for the growth of the church, is the pioneer and the leader of the church, is the shepherd and the guide of the church. In fact, is the life and the light of the church. As the body without the head will be dead, so the church without Christ will be dead. The head is responsible for everything that takes part, that takes place in the body. The head is responsible for the life and the growth and the direction of the body. So is Christ to the church. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is the head. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, into Christ, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom, that is from that Christ, the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, 
according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. If the church grows, if the church is enlightened, if the church is full of understanding and wisdom, if the church is able to plan well, if the church is the representation of God here now on earth, it is because Christ is the head, the source of power of the church, and is the life and light of the church, is the one that is shepherding and guiding the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. That is why, as members of the church, we always look up to the head. We always look up to Jesus Christ, the head of the church. What are we to do? What are we to believe? Where are we to go? In what way are we to worship? We always look to the word of Jesus because he is the head of the church. is the one that directs and gives us the things that we have to do. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Let me read chapter 1 before I go to chapter 2. Verse 19. For it, ha it has pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. The false preachers were coming to the saints of God at Colossae. And they were telling them that uh, Christ is not sufficient. You must add the Sabbath. Add the Mosaic law. You must add the rudiments of this world. You must add another kind of worship. They were deceiving the Colossian believers. They were saying Christ is not sufficient. You must add philosophy. You must add some hidden knowledge of secret cause. They were saying that Christ is not sufficient. You must add the worship of angels. And you must add a lot of other things. But then Paul the Apostle said, don't ever listen to them. Don't ever listen to them. There is nothing that you need outside Christ because it has pleased the Father that in him shall all the fullness dwell. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Colossians chapter 2 from verse 3. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding through the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It tells us there is nothing you are going to get outside Christ except shame and confusion and darkness and judgment. But that in Christ you have all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge from above that is hidden. Look at verse 9. And in, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Nothing you are looking for outside him. Are you going to be made perfect if you just remain in Christ? Are you going, are you going to be complete if you, if you remain in Christ? Look at verse 10. For and ye are complete in him. You don't need anything outside him. You want to be saved? Ye are complete in him. You want to be sanctified? That's available in him. Ye are complete in him. You want power? Many people are looking for power and they have to go to the bar beach or they have to go to the burial ground or they have to go to the hole in a cave or they have to go to a forest or they have to go to a shrine or they have to travel to one kind of country somewhere. You don't need all that. Ye are complete in him. You want power? It's all in Christ. You want knowledge? It's all in Christ. You want understanding? It's all in Christ. Above all, you want eternal life. You want a place in heaven. You want joy on earth and joy in heaven. You want happiness and happiness forever. It's all in him. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Remember that anything you need, everything you need, everything is in him. In John chapter 1 verse 16. John chapter 1. Verse 16, and of his fullness, of his fullness, have we all received grace for grace, of his fullness, the fullness of all that you may need here on earth, the fullness of all that you may need to prepare you for heaven, the fullness of all that you may need to see you through until you enter into heaven and you bow before the Lord and you inherit eternal life, everything is hid in Christ. And if you believe in Christ, that is the gateway of receiving the fullness from him. And after you have been saved, you move on again, you get more in Christ. 
And after you have been sanctified, you move on again. You get more in Christ. And after you have, after you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you move on in Christ again. And then it fills you with wisdom. It fills you with understanding. And it begins to bear fruit in your life until you come to the measure and the fullness of the stature of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 13. Here we are coming. The unity of the faith. You have got saved. Don't stop there. You need to get into the depth and the height of, the, of what is in Christ. Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The more you know him, the more you have of him. The more you know him, the more you receive of the fullness coming from above. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If you have not been born again, it's because you have not taken the personality of Jesus Christ very seriously. But as you see tonight, that Jesus is a very express image of the invisible God. He is the creator of all things. He is the head of the church. And as you come to him in faith, he will save you. If you have been saved, you have not got the fullness yet. Come into Christ more. You can get sanctified. If you have been sanctified, there is still more. You can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And even after you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can plunge into Christ. Until you have the fullness of his grace, the fullness of his understanding. And you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And thank God because of the revelation we have got of Jesus Christ. His name is Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. His name shall be called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father is the Prince of Peace. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And he is the one that made all things, is the creator of the heaven and earth. Invisible things and visible things, what you see and what you cannot see. He made everything. He made them all. What you are sitting on, what you are having, what you are wearing, what you are breathing, what you are eating. Jesus made them all. Why not give all the praise to Jesus, all the honor to Jesus, all the glory to Jesus because of who he is. Because of who he is. He is a creator. He is the express image of the Father and is the head of the church. Give all the glory to him. Give all the glory to him. Give all the glory to him. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Emmanuel. Do you know Jesus? The Counselor. Do you know Jesus? The Savior. Do you know Jesus? The Everlasting Father. Do you know Jesus? The Prince of Peace. Do you know Jesus? The Creator of all things. Do you know Jesus? The one that shall judge even the quick and the dead. Do you know Jesus? The one that is same yesterday, today and forever. Do you know Jesus? Is he your savior? Is he your sanctifier? Is he your healer? Is he your deliverer? Is he your baptizer in the Holy Ghost? Is he your hope? Is he the one that is taking you to heaven? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Have you met Jesus Christ? Have you believed on his name? Has he saved you? Has he delivered you? Has he changed your life? Do you know Jesus? The Father has revealed him to us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And that Word was in the beginning with God. By him all things are made. Without him was nothing made that was made. Know him today before you go. Know Jesus today before you go. Know Jesus today before you go. Let him save you. Let him sanctify you. Let him be your guide. Let him be your redeemer. Let him be your king and your lord. Let him baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Let him heal you. Let him deliver you. Let him be your shepherd. Let him continue to guide you. Let him continue to show you the way. Let him continue to reveal the Father unto you. Have you met Jesus? Have you met Jesus? Have you known Jesus is the supreme one? Is the all-sufficient one? We don't need anything outside him. In him dwelleth all the fullness of God bodily. 
and we are complete in him. Know Jesus and you'll be satisfied in life and satisfied in eternity.